from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's Mind the Gap, a practical web series for young and future music educators. Tonight on the program, band director at Bennett's Mill Middle School in Georgia, Savannah Cole. Orchestra director at Harrison High School in Georgia, Koji Mori. Band director at Maplewood Middle School in Louisiana, Mickey Smith Jr. Director of bands at Wakeland High School in Texas, Tanner Smith. Tonight's conversation moderated by Zachary Harris and Susan Smith. Please welcome Zachary Harris and Susan Smith. Good evening, and welcome to the 10th episode of Mind the Gap, a webinar series focused on young and new teachers and those student teachers whose experiences have been and potentially will be interrupted by the pandemic. My name is Susan Smith, and I'm an educational consultant for Music for All and a lecturer in music education at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. I've taught at all levels and areas of music education, and I'm especially interested in supporting young teachers as my daughters are starting their second and fourth year as years as music educators. The first of our episodes I co-hosted with David Starnes, Director of Orchestras at Kennesaw Mountain High School. But as we move forward, we'll be inviting guest moderators onto the show with David and I to give more perspective and insight. Tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Zachary Harris, and he'll be the first to introduce himself, and then the rest of the panelists will do the same. Zach? Thank you, Susan. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Zachary Harris, and I am currently a music instructor at William Carey University in Hattiesburg, Mississippi where I teach applied uh, low brass and I conduct a concert band and also supervise student teachers. Uh, prior to coming to Cary, I taught in the public school for 31 years, all in Mississippi. And so I am a Southern boy. And, um, and I, I taught middle school and high school mostly. I am also a member of the Music for All Educational Consultant Team as well as the Urban Education Advisory to, uh, Team and the Executive Director of Reach Through Music. Uh, I am also a 2018 Hall of Fame inductee of the Mississippi chapter of Phi Beta Mu. Delighted to be here tonight. Awesome, we're glad that you're here. Tanner, tell us about yourself. Yeah, good evening, everybody. My name is Tanner Smith. I'm the director of bands at Wake High School in Frisco, Texas, just north of the Dallas area. Um, I'm in my eighth year of teaching. <clears throat> um, spent all, all eight years in Texas teaching. I grew up in the Houston area and got my undergrad in music education at the University of Oklahoma. Um, uh, from there, I moved down to the San Antonio area, started teaching middle school down there, and then ended up making my way up to the Dallas area. And I'm in my fifth year currently at Wakeland High School. Um, I also have had the opportunity to have different opportunities with Music for All uh, to either march and teach in the uh, Honor Band and the Rose Parade. And so I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you all tonight. Fantastic. So. Thanks so much. Koji? Good evening, everybody. I'm Koji Mori. I'm the director of orchestras at Harrison High School in uh, the Atlanta area. And I, this is my 10th year of teaching. Um, I've been teaching orchestra for about five years now. Before uh, I was at Harrison, I was at Lasseter High School, and I was uh, the assistant orchestra director there. I taught band and orchestra for, uh, for a little bit um, while I was there as well. I have some experience teaching middle school band. That's where I started. Um, I started my career right, uh, right at the end of you know, the recession time in 2008, and there were no jobs. So you know, the, the first thing I found, I graduated in December. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience and a great learning experience for me. Uh, I went to Columbus State University for my undergrad, went to the University of Georgia for my master's degree, and I just finished a specialist degree uh, in education at Barry College. Fantastic. And I don't, I think all of us would be surprised to hear you say I am Spartacus with, with your mild mannered <laughs> way about you. But that, that's how most of us, most of us know you from your, your drum corps days back in the day. Savannah Cole, you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I am the band director at Bennett's Mill Middle School, um, also in the Atlanta area. And this is my first year there. I really enjoy um, being in Georgia. So I, there are a few other Georgia band directors on the call. Um, I get to work with the Fayette County High School Band um, with Dr. Roden um, and Andrew McMillan, which has been a joy in the summers. Um, I get to work with the Music City Drum and Bugle Corps. I'm on staff there. 
Um, and we were joking ahead of time that there's a lot of Smiths on this call that aren't related to each other, but I am related to Susan Smith. That's my mom. So um, if you see us joking and, and poking fun at each other, that's the relationship. So <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Well, we're glad you're here. And, and another Smith that I'm not related to, but we're so glad that you're here. Mickey, tell us about yourself. Well, thanks so much for having me. My name is Mickey Smith Jr. And I teach in the Bayou State down here in Louisiana. I'm in my 50, 15th year of teaching at Maplewood Middle School. Uh, I've taught in both Louisiana and Texas. And during that time, I've, I've grown two programs uh, to encompass about half of the school's population. Um, and in that time, too, I've also been named uh, Educator of the Year six times and most recently been named Grammy Music Educator of the Year. And not to say that to impress anybody, but just to impress um, that with these opportunities, such as the one we have right now, it's so wonderful to see great educators and be connected with great educators because you begin to see common threads um, in, in how we engage the students. And now I'm kind of devoting myself to taking those lessons learned and sharing them in a meaningful way with other educators through my Sound 180 Educators platform where we help educators create a sound 180 days of classroom instruction in harmony so that you teach by design and not by default. So uh, thank you again so much. Just uh, honored to be here and looking forward to just a great evening. Great, well, and Zach's gonna take us on to our, our first area of, of things we're gonna talk about tonight. Okay, well, let's let's jump right in it. Okay, guys, so uh, we, we're gonna throw a couple, of, want, wanna get a couple of things from you. When you first started teaching, what do you wish you knew um, that you didn't know when you first started? So let, let's, let's just start and we can just start. Anybody want to go ahead and go first? That'd be fine. I, I wish I wish I would have known it wasn't an exact science and nobody's expecting perfection. So my first year teaching, um, ironically, um, for those that don't know, I, I live in Southwest Louisiana. So those hurricanes that, that were hitting the Louisiana coast, like literally the community I'm in is ground zero. So we literally got hit by the eye of both those hurricanes in the span of six weeks. And the irony to that is my very first year of teaching was 2005 and two hurricanes hit Louisiana in 2005, hurricanes Katrina and hurricanes Rita. And I say that to say, I went in with a certain perspective. Uh, I never imagined myself teaching middle school, but I was very exact. I thought, you know, things had to be a certain way. And it was through those hurricanes I realized when you're in the middle of a crisis, it's about caring about people first. And honestly, I would have never thought about it in that time. But looking back, those hurricanes taught me so much because it forced me to not put the subject matter above showing the students that they matter. So that was that was something I wish I would have known going in. I could have saved myself a lot of undue stress in knowing that at the end of the day, it's about giving them an experience much like we all had an experience at some point that, that allowed us to see music as something bigger than, uh, than anything on a piece of paper, it's, it's life changing. You know, that reminds me of uh, I had, I, a mentor of mine before I started teaching always used to tell me these things about, you know, people don't remember what you say, but they always remember how you made them feel. Um, and that certainly is, I can certainly relate with that, Mickey. That's such a great story. I, I started uh, in middle school and I wasn't expecting it as well. Um, I think the biggest thing I wish I knew more about was, you know, managing a classroom of, you know, 50, 60 students. Um, and honestly, that comes with a lot of time, right? And, and experience. And, and um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things I, I'm, I'm glad I had and I, and I wish I sought more of was looking for for mentors and people who would um there's so many people that are willing to give information and i felt like i had to know everything and I, what i quickly realized was i knew nothing <laughs> i graduated with a degree and i thought i i knew a lot and i realized that i didn't know a whole lot because it really didn't matter what kind of information i gave them if that connection wasn't there then all the information in the world was useless um, so that that relationship thing is was was probably the most important uh, lesson I learned in that first year. It's just developing simple relationships, even if it's just what's your favorite TV show. Those simple dialogues, those make all the difference in the world with connecting with with kids. Yeah, you're not going to learn it in textbook, see. So you're not going to learn it in the classroom. So those, the mentor is going to want going to going to have that key that, that those those experiences that they've 
they've had. And so that's that's great. Savannah, what about you? I mean, one or two years in? Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> so I kind of thought of this question um, first from kind of a college student sort of perspective. Um, how could I have maybe harnessed those years a little bit more effectively? And I think the answer uh, for me is just to always, always be thinking of how am I going to apply what I'm learning now to my future classroom and my future students. And that's something that you know, and you're preparing to have your own program. Um, but even things like your, your lessons, your applied lessons, um, that's probably the highest level individual instruction you're going to get on your specific instrument. So how does that professor teach? What works for you? Do they teach you differently than somebody else in the studio? Um, so just always being a student, not just in your music education classes, but um, in every experience that you have in college. Um, and then my, my other thing, my other advice for college students is that your first year teaching, um, your, your students and their parents don't care uh, who you are or what you've done. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you were a big deal in the drum corps world or um, I was drum major at Alabama. Um, it was after three years of being there, I thought I was something, right? And then the next year I was convincing 12 and 13 year olds that I was cool enough to, you know, to be in front of them. So um, they don't really care what your past accomplishments have been or anything like that. They care that you care about them uh, and they care about the experience that you create for them. And Mickey, you touched on that as well. It's all about the experience that you create musically, socially, um, everything. It's all a big package. So that's, that is great. That is so, so great. Uh, what about you, Tanner? Yeah, it's, it's so funny because we sit here and we're talking and I think the consistent thread between all of us and probably any teacher you talk to is it is hard to it's, it's almost impossible to learn it unless you experience is building empathy for people and for students and you know, the more the longer you the longer you teach the harder it sometimes is because you're removing yourself from their age. Um, when I first started teaching I was 21 right out of college, kind of like Savannah like I had I had marched five years of drum corps I went to a uh, a, a well-known university and I, I, I went to a well-known high school band program with a great experience student taught with a well-known high school band program so I thought I knew everything and then like Koji said the first time you step in that classroom you really know absolutely nothing and so relying on the one thing that we can do which is be human and make those connections with people and I and I, I know for me this year in particular with with the coronavirus and everything that has been the the turning point of what has kept students engaged and in our program is just empathizing with them and understanding that as you know we have some students who choose to come to face-to-face -face instruction and choose to participate in marching band and concert band and we have some families and students who choose not to for their own health and safety reasons and for me it's as much as you want all your kids to be here and to be able to make music and want to make music it's empathizing with the reality of, you know, they're, they're taking in consideration their health and their safety and, and we have to do that for them as well. And, and, uh, and then the other thing with that is, um, you know, as, as, you're, as you're empathizing with the students, you also have to connect somehow with the parents. And, you know, I was actually, I have a student teacher and we met yesterday because she's wrapping up her time with us. And I said, the hardest part of the job for me, especially coming into a head director job after only being an assistant for three years, is and being a teacher for three years is learning how to communicate with all the stakeholders not just the parents not just the administrators um, not just the students um, but communicating with all of them in an effective way that gets them to be the biggest cheerleaders for you because the easiest thing is to just if you get a parent that's frustrated or or something is just to go off because it's, it's it's the easiest thing versus sitting out and really empathizing with okay why is this person feeling this way and so even with the communication piece and everything, I think empathy is the one word that I had to, and it was kind of a rude awakening because, you know, you, you connect when you're, when you're in college, you connect with people that you want to connect with, not people that you have to connect with. And so that, that, and as a teacher, you have to connect with everybody, whether you like the student or not. And so that, that was the big thing for me was learning empathy. That's great. That, that kind of takes us back to a question asked by um, one of our attendees who I would love to say is a first year teacher, but I know is our Southern Division president for NAFME from North Carolina, Sonia Williams. So Sonia, thank you for asking. But she asked, how do we reach those students who seem to be unreachable? 
how do we make a connection to those that that uh, kind of have a wall or a barrier? Does anybody have some 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 thoughts on that or things you've been able to do to do that? I know for us, you know, we we have a big program. We have 250 students in the band program, so there's 250 personalities that you're connecting with, and no two kids are the same. Um, we're fortunate where I am, and I know I'm not naive at all, and I know that what we have, especially in Texas, is very different than other places, and especially in the su north suburb of Dallas and Frisco. I have five staff members with me, so I have four assistant band directors and myself. One of them is a percussion specialist, and so we have five different personalities to try to figure out and connect with all these students. But even with them, you still have to find a way to make a connection with them because bottom line is you're going to have a student that's hard to connect with you in your ensemble where you are the main primary teacher for that student. And so for me, it's always just starting dialogue, high fives, fist bumps, just to show them that you're always on their side. Whether you see eye to eye on things or not, you're always going to root for them. Um, and so th that's where it starts for me. For students that I can tell we don't have any interest uh, that are the same is we just start and maybe most of those those relationships are maybe just a fist bump or a high five and that's it. But at least as long as it's a smile, not a frown, that's that's a win for some for some kids in, in trying to reach with them. Awesome. Fantastic. Anybody else? Mickey, you're unmuted. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Tanner. I mean, it's, it's, it's those little moments, those, those little ordinary, beautiful moments that make all the difference. I can think of so many instances where I get a letter from a kid 10 years later and they say something to the effect of, you said this one thing and in that moment, that's what I needed more than anything. Uh, sometimes we don't realize that if we acknowledge a child, if we connect with them, we may be the only person in the course of a day that has literally said their name. Uh, and that's that's not to be negative. Uh, you know, I, I have a beautiful wife, two kids at home, and we don't always address each other by our names. You know, we're in the house, you know, and and for a child hearing their name is a powerful, powerful thing. And you may not see it as anything significant, but it may be the world to them. I have a young man that I, I uh, a colleague I teach with. He's the assistant director at the school. And early in his career, he was having trouble with a group of students at a different school he taught at. He asked me, well, how can I, how can I make this difference? Because this is a, a tough kid to reach. And I asked him, I said, what do you know about him? I said, he said, not much. I said, well, ask him some things about the student. He asked, he found out he plays basketball. I said, that's easy, man. I said, go to the game, sit on the first bleacher. And like every, I don't care if my man just dribbled the ball twice. You get up, just give him a hand clap, you know, give him a little, the little, the little point in the gun or whatever like that. And then after the game, hang around because the coach is going to talk to him and be there when they get out, whether they lose, win, or draw, and be there to give them, like you said, that fist bump. He did that. He calls me the next day. He goes, oh, my God, this dude, he's amazing. Like, he came in, and he was like, he's telling everybody, Mr. Cook came to my, my, my game today. He said that was a model student. And the thing was, he was that alpha. He was the alpha dog of the class. So whereas before he'd take them in the wrong direction, now that he believed in this teacher, he was the one that was telling the rest of the class, hey, y'all pipe down. You know, he's trying to teach today. And he became his biggest advocate. So a lot of times kids are just looking for somebody that believes, somebody that uh, sees them, because that's really what we all want at the end of the day. That's it. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oftentimes those are the best leaders. We just haven't found a way to channel that, that the skills that they have. So Fantastic. So, so we're going to talk about that first job. How do we get the right job? And, and, you know, how do we know what the right job is? Several of you have gone through a couple of ch changes and, and, and sometimes we apply for jobs. We take the first one or we want to have specific types of jobs. Um, do you have any advice as far as getting that first job or, and, and marketing yourself or things that, that you would share with people? Anybody like to go first, Koji? Go ahead. Sure, I'll hit on that. Um, when I graduated, there were no jobs in my area. So I started reaching out anywhere. I just, I just needed a job so I could eat. And that was, that was real life at the time. Uh, so I wasn't picky. I, I, was, I would have taken anything. So I just applied many locations, different states. Um, and, and there just happened to be in my, in my local district, somebody who was having some health conditions. Uh, so they they had this opening of a halftime position, and I think there were like a hundred applicants for that halftime position. And and the biggest thing was the I think the, I'm convinced the only reason I got the job is because I I had a connection of networking um, that I had related with with somebody I knew, and and they had put in a good word or or advocated for me. So I think one one of the things is is you know 
doing things that aren't required in the degree program. So whether that's going to your, your state convention, whether it's virtual or if there are certain, you know, there's always some kind of hangs, whether it's, you know, I was just looking through my email and I saw, oh, the ad, there's an ASTA hang on Thursday. Cool. With the local ASTA, you know, community. That's fantastic. And just kind of look for those opportunities. And if you don't see them, then, you know, a good place to start is with just your teachers, maybe even your high school teachers that you had. Um, and usually they can kind of point you in, yeah, well, you know, you can come to this location or, you know, you can, you're welcome to observe my virtual class or, um, but you got to kind of go after them and look for those opportunities and then jump on them because you, you never know when you can you know, spark a conversation just from even if it's a virtual realm, whether it's you know, provoking you to think through something more or you know, it, it inspires you to kind of nerd out on something like nerding out. That is probably the big, the best thing you can do, especially right now when you can't always visit a classroom. You know, if you're really bad at playing flute, see if you can borrow a flute and try to learn it because like there's no better time than now it only gets harder because your responsibilities you know grow and every, all of that um so you know i think there's a lot of ways to kind of increase that and then when people see you kind of being the go-getter oh wow he's a trumpet player and he's trying to play oboe that's weird is what you think they're thinking but what they're really thinking is wow he's a go-getter that's really interesting i'll keep in mind uh that he's got quite the uh, the, the work ethic for that so you know, finding those opportunities, that would be my advice for that. Look for them. Go ahead, Savannah. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, so when I was applying for my first job four years ago, I don't think I thought enough about, um, a about a lot of factors, right? So now that, that I'm kind of on the other side of it, first of all, I know a little bit more what I want and what I'm looking for and what a good fit is. Um, I believed and still believe that you can make a good band program anywhere. Um, so geographically, nothing like that was an issue to me. Um, size of district wasn't an, an issue for me. Maybe it is for you. And just think about things like that and decide. Um, do you want to work on a team with someone else? Do you want to just kind of go on sandbox mode like I did and be the only band director at a high school program? And um, do your thing and see what you can build by yourself um, and then compatibility with that team that goes back to your network and um, your mentors right do are you going to work well together do you see eye to eye um, also new band directors we tend to be young and have all these great ideas about things that we're going to do differently um, and you just want to consider for the community that you're looking to work in are your ideas um, in the next level up the next like zip code right next door or is it a completely different planet than um, what what the norm is and just kind of that community compatibility as far as the program that you think you would match up best with um, versus the program that the community matches up best with there's no good good or bad or right or wrong way um, to have a band program as we've already said on this call but compatibility really is um, a big part of it and maybe something that I would have considered more going in that first job. I loved my first job. I'm, I no regrets. It worked out perfectly. Um, but yeah, uh, also you want to think about whenever you interview, um, you're interviewing them as well, right? So um, do they have band boosters in on your interview? Uh, are, are parents opinions that that important to who they hire? Do they not? Is it just a, a principle? What does that principal believe about the role of the band in the school and in the community, right? You're interviewing um, the administration and the school as well. So just things to think about um, as you're looking for that first job. I think it's easy to kind of miss that. It's just like going to, to a bank for a loan. You know, we think that they're helping us out, but we're, we're really the customer. Same thing walking into an interview like that. You're interviewing them as well. Tanner, did you have something to share? Yeah, it was kind of along with Koji, one of my mentors when I, you know, I, I graduated in December. And so finding a job in January is not easy, especially right now with, with what we have going on. Um, but I, one of the mentors that I had at that time was, he said, you know, the only job you're not going to get is the one you don't apply for. And so, you know, in, especially if you're one of, if you're a student teaching right now and you're uh, about to graduate in December, um, you know, any job that you can apply for right now, it, it, it might not be what you want in the long run for your career length, 
but it's experience. Um, and experience, the, the only, it kind of goes back to things we wish we would have known as our first year is you, you don't know what you don't know until you get put into the situation of the classroom. Um, I thought I knew, I thought I was, I knew as much as I could coming out of college on uh, wind pedagogy with brass and woodwinds, but until you get into the classroom, um, especially middle school, um, that's because that was my very first job coming, graduating in December, I taught middle school. Um, you know, in, I taught an inner city school in inner city San Antonio, um, taught a one school. And so in the resources, there were very limited, but I grew, I think I'm where I am today because of that experience of teaching at what would not have been my ideal career path. Um, but it allowed me to, to, to learn the things that I didn't know to force myself into outside of the classroom to go learn them. Um, and so, so, and then along with that, Koji had mentioned that the networking thing, I'm, I mean, for me, I grew up in Texas. I went to school in Oklahoma and then I, I came back to Texas, but you know, pretty much anywhere in the country other than Texas, it's a pretty close drive from point A to point B. And so I was fortunate, you know, I went to the Oklahoma Music Educators Association Conference because I was in school up there. I also every year would drive down to San Antonio and go to the Texas Music Educators Association. So trying to networking, not just within those states of where you're in school or where you plan on living or plan on working, uh, try to use those resources to, to make those networks outside. For me, all my network that I got was either through uh, Music for All, through all the you know, I was, I, I did, I did the music for all things when I was in high school. I was fortunate enough to march in the Rose Parade for three times for the for music for all. I got to teach on staff for a year, and I get to do it again in 2021. But those are like all of those people I, I've met through either drum corps uh, or music for all or Texas Music Educators Association or Oklahoma Music Educators Association. So networking and not being, uh, I always tell my student teachers, you, you it's impossible to be a pest. As a, as a student who's learning how to get a job. It's impossible. You can bug me as much as you want. When you apply for a job, if you don't hear anything back, just keep sending reminders. Hey, here I am, here's who I am. This is me, I'm interested in this job. This job looks really interesting to me. Uh, here's in keep mark, because if the second they start looking at resumes and applications, they might have no idea who you are. But if they see Tanner Smith email me 500 times, that person is, pers that person is persistent, has initiative to keep going after it, and so they might take a chance on figuring out who you are and taking and, and getting to know who you are. Hey, uh, uh, that, that is some great, great uh, answers, guys. Uh, in, in this next part, let's go into when you first got started. Uh, what are uh, what, what advice do you have to um, to give on how to avoid a new teacher pitfall? Mickey, you want to start on this one? New teacher pitfalls. Well, you know, the biggest thing I, I, I feel is I think when we get into the classroom, I know I, I was guilty of this. We fail sometimes to realize that teaching is just like our instruments. You know, we come into college and we have an applied um, lessons, studio experience that we're with. We're, we have someone that we are being mentored by, being taught by. We're listening to a model sound that hopefully we're trying to aspire to. We listen to other great artists and we, we go to recital hour and we attend uh, concerts and we're participating in ensembles and we're doing all these things to grow our craft. But for so many folks, I think, and myself included, when we te think teaching, we think it's something totally different, but teaching's an art form. Teaching is a performance. So, you know, for that first year teacher, teacher, that first year or whatever year teacher, I think the, the advice is the same. Treat your teaching as the art form it is. So for me, you know, I tell my student teachers, I tell my young teachers that I mentor, take advantage of the technology. You know, when I started teaching, I had to go get people to come watch me and, and, and mentor me. Matter of fact, my first year teaching, I kept begging people to help me. I'm like, I'm in over my head. I don't know what I'm doing. And my assistant principal would be like, oh, Smith, you're doing fine. He'd have his cup of coffee. You're doing fine, man. You're doing fine. And he would always say that. And then we got to May and he knocks on my door and he had this total different look on his face. He said, I am so sorry. I said, what's wrong, Mr. Como? He said, you really needed help, didn't you? you 
I just found out you were a first year teacher. I thought this was just your first year at Maplewood. I'm like, no, dude, I've been struggling for like the last nine months. You know, looking back on it, what a wonderful compliment, but it didn't help me at the time. But the fact of the matter is, had I had the technology back then of a phone you could set up, I would record myself. And how many times have we recorded ourselves playing, you know, as we were getting ready for that private lesson? How many times did we go get a pro we paid for a lesson? You know, I think we should look into having teacher coaches. You know, I mean, find that great teacher and go sit under them or have them come to your your school uh, because you're never too big to grow. So so for that person that's out there, whether it's your first year teaching, there's no shame in having someone be that 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 accountability partner, that advocate, whatever you want to think of that person that's walking this this 180 with you, uh, these 180 days of school. So that would just be my biggest thing to a first year teacher is to treat it like the art form that it is understand it's a performance in, a, in an essence, and that it's, it's one that you can grow, you can cultivate, and you can develop as your career gets better. So it's like, it's like fine wine. It should be better with time. <laughs> that, that, that is so true, man. You know, when I first started teaching, uh, uh, there was no Google. It, it, it was no go. It was a telephone that you called and you would ask one question of a, of a, of a mentor. And then that was it. That's all, that's all you would do for that day, you know, but and uh, so it, it is so true. And, and I love what you said about that, Mickey, about uh, just like doing an applied class, because every day you go in there when you're playing that instrument, you're going in there and you're trying to experience and do something different, experiment with it to try to learn different ways. And you hit it right on the head right there when you said that, because that you can you can apply it to teaching every day. You know, you can't get stuck in that same old trap all the time or doing it the same way. You got to be experimental. That's great. Uh, Savannah, you 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 were you were shaking your head and agreeing with a lot of that. What do you what do you say about the new uh, you're avoiding those pitfalls? Yeah, I think that what Mickey said was great. I would add that there there was never a first year teacher that didn't uh, that didn't fall into a lot of the pitfalls. You know what I mean? Like there are always, if it's not one thing, it's another, you're juggling a million things at once. Um, and sometimes something slips through the cracks, right? I think that the biggest pitfall to avoid for longevity in this career um, is to handle the pitfalls well, right? So we recover, we move on, we learn and we grow from it. Um, nobody has all of the strengths and all of the tools that you need to be a band director right from the beginning right i think that everybody on this call would agree that we're all still learning right you you talk to your mentors and they're still learning and developing and growing so um, this is really a um a profession of lifelong learning and so that first year i think that um if we let ourselves feel overcome by failure or by um expectations that you put on yourself, right? We all wanna have a, an amazing band program. We know what that looks like, um, but it just takes time sometimes and um, recovering from those pitfalls, I think is the biggest pitfall to avoid. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I just thought of something, Savannah, I'm gonna hop on uh, off you, what you said. I tell my students, you can make failures just as long as you don't make the fail yours. And I think that's a big thing to remember that first year because everybody's gonna mess up but just remember not to hold on to that because the longer you hold on, you're going to miss what the next and best is going to be. So that's just a big thing. You hit, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. yeah. I would say just a quick transition too. Uh, I know for me, you know, I, I, I taught as an assistant for three years. And I, I felt more comfortable as a teacher after, and then you go into a new job or a new title, or you, maybe even the same position, but a new campus everywhere, every campus you go to or every job you go to is going to have new pitfalls because you're learning the campus administration. You're learning the, the directors you're working with. I know for me, I felt way more comfortable as a teacher after teaching for three and a half years as an assistant. So I was like, okay, I'm ready. I got the head director job. Completely different ballgame. Uh, the things that I was more comfortable with, which was the classroom stuff, I, I, I relied on the stuff that I was comfortable with in the classroom. But all of the other stuff that comes with it with budgeting and bus requests and parent communication and scheduling and all of that, there, there are so many other new teacher pitfalls that come into it each time you move from campus to campus, position to position. Um, so, and that's kind of goes with the longevity of my advice. Cause you know, I was, I'm within the first three years of teaching or four years of teaching, I was on three campuses in four years. Uh, and, and so 
for that, I never personally, for me, I never had an opportunity to really get my feet ground and set and learn the ways of what is effective for me as a teacher. Cause I was always learning new systems and processes for the campus or the district or what worked for that band program. And so if you find a place that you're, you're happy with, try to stick around as long as you can and learn either from yourself or the mentor that you have and keep developing from that. That's great. That's great. Ko Koji, let, let's go into uh, communicating with the administration and your parents, you know, which is something that, you know, all first year teachers are really nervous about uh, how they're going to approach their parents when they're trying to organize a booster or, uh, club and things like that. Uh, what advice can you give on, on communicating with your administrators, parents, as well as your students? That's a great question. And, and I think it all ties into what everyone's talking about with failure. I think, I think we have to change our perspective as a, especially when we're coming out of the degree program. Um, failure is, is a great learning opportunity. And I think if you look at it as this is a learning experience, then it's, it's not as fearful or you don't have to be as fearful of failing. It's gonna happen. And so the, the question is, what will you do about it? And do you, can you recognize that something is not working? So for example, if we're talking about communication and it's not, you know, there's maybe some tension or, you know, you're going to get your angry parent emails, depending on the community, you either have those helicopter parents that are always on you or uh, you'll have no, uh, no contact whatsoever. Um, and so that finding that balance uh, really comes down to, okay, how, how am I coming across, not just to the students, but to, to the parents. Um, and so I, I had to learn, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of management systems out there, right? Whether it's, you know, cut time or charms or email or, you know, whatever email system it is, the, the most important thing is that you make sure that you're, you're organized. And what's, what's worked for me is having a weekly, here's kind of my announcements that I send out weekly to my community. And, and I found that the more I set those up with, here are the direct links to the things that we're doing this week or here are the upcoming events. And it doesn't have to be super long. Like right now, my, my newsletters are very short because we're not allowed to do anything. I can't have after school rehearsals. I can't do concerts. I can't do anything right now. So even if it's, hey, this is information on Allstate, the fact that they're hearing from you, that relieves you later because you don't get those, well, how come I didn't hear about that? Well, they get a weekly newsletter. And a lot of the problems I found as I started doing that uh, really kind of went away. The questions became fewer and the, the angry emails, when they come, it's usually a misunderstanding. And I, and I think sometimes we result with, you know, it's because, and you have this justification for why you said something or, or gave an information the way you did. Um, but a lot of times parents just want to want to hear, just want to be heard. Um, and I, I found that sometimes, especially for a conflict with a student, um, before the child gets home, it's best if you can call the parent. Calling is sometimes the best. Email and whatever form of texting, uh, a lot gets lost in translation there. And so generally, uh, I, I'd say almost every conflict that I've had, especially when I taught at the middle school and I had some rugrats, uh, I would call the parents and that's what one of my mentors said, hey, you should just call them. Make sure you catch them before the kid gets home. And because then they'll hear your side of the story first and then it won't get twisted. And that, gosh, that saved me a lot of times. I had, I had a parent come, come all the way to the school and I thought he was going to reprimand me. Big old guy, probably I was 300 pounds, came in the room. You know, we had a meeting scheduled and he reamed his son for acting out. And it's all because, you know, I just, get, I didn't twist anything. I said, here's what happened today. I just wanted to let you know. He said, thanks for letting me know. He heard this, you know, the story, the sob story from his son, brought him to school in the office. And boy, that I, I felt for the kid by the end of it because he was just bawling. But, you know, after that, no problems, nothing. Everything was great. Um, so, you know, just being, being organized with how you're giving that information, there's lots of ways to do it, but I think consistency and, and giving that information on a regular basis, that is huge on being successful with, with, you know, taming down any of the fires that may come up. 
I think a lot of these things kind of get us back to kind of, you know, how do we keep that job and how do we keep, do those things to continue to thrive? We're, we're starting to get a lot of questions over here from our participants um, and we really appreciate them kind of kind of doing that. I'll try and noodle some of those those through to make sure that they're appropriate. But I think one, the first one will ask, um, on the first year, would you try and meet the students before band camp or wait until the first day of camp? Uh, um, for me, of course, I, I, I would I would try to communicate as much as possible as soon as possible to kind of do some of those icebreakers. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have some thoughts or ideas on that as far as if you should wait till you meet everybody. But I but I think trying to make those connections and communications with those students with the new with the new folks as soon as possible. I know that sometimes um, we people have had the experience even in the spring to to meet the students beforehand at a at a concert or something like that. Do any of you have any experiences like that that you'd like to share or? Tanner? Yeah, I, I think you know I I came into a program that the director had been here for ten years. He opened the school. I got hired uh, fourteen days before band camp started, um, and so um, and you know with especially with high school students, my my I. And it goes back to the very first thing we started talking about and Mickey mentioned that you got to build student relationships with those students. The earlier you can start building those relationships, the, the easier it's going to be. Uh, because once you start connecting with one kid, other kids want to start connecting with you and other kids want to start connecting. And then so like for me coming in, in the high school setting, connecting and even middle school, connecting with those leaders, the leadership team um, first, uh, the, the most visible members of, the, of that program. Uh, not in, in like, you know, so what, when I came in uh, to my school, I came in on July 10th, band camp started two weeks later. Um, and um, I, I was very fortunate to have the, the boosters through like a welcoming event for us um, the week before band camp, but it allowed me not only to meet the students, but to meet the parents. Um, and so, and it, not every parent and student came, but enough did to where I could start building those relationships and that trust. So then when I did get in front of the entire band, there were already people on my team uh, and, and people that were on that, that knew who I was and, and knew that I cared about them and cared about their interests. And so the early as early as you can, I don't think there's I mean, before you get the job is not the best time, probably. But once you get the job and it's all but the school boards approved of it and the and the band students find out that you're that you're going to be the new band director or whatever, or you're going to be the choir director or, the, or whatever it is try to get to meet those students and start building those relationships just so you can figure out what they are into and what they like. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and we'll, we'll get to some more of these questions in, in just a little bit, but a, a little bit about keeping that job and about perception and, and how and professionalism and, and what the perception is of you and trying to keep that job. Does anyone have some advice on, on those kinds of subjects? Um. Mickey, I, I, I believe in what I call the SYBY mindset. So SYBY uh, BY says, see yourself beyond yourself. So every day you go in, it's an understanding that um, relative to, to who you are to them, whether it's administration, whether it's community, whether it's students, you know, it, it may be your band, but it's their school. It's their community. You know, they may be your student, but they're someone's child. And as wonderful as the band is, and go band, I'm all for band, changed my life, right? Changed all of our lives. At the end of the day, the community, the school, you're still serving it. And that student may be your student, but it's always that balancing act. And I'm gonna be honest with you, you know, as you have children, it changes the way you see the kids, you know, especially as they get older and you begin to understand, oh, that's why that parent approach me the way they did you know maybe it wasn't me maybe they have a teenager <laughs> you know i mean like it just it, it changes your whole concept of, of of what life really is so i just encourage folks um you know like simple things like if you send out an email uh, you know kind of check yourself when you send the email or is it operating with that that spirit of empathy that we talked about before one thing that i do my empathy check is honestly i just read an email angrily like if I type it out, I read it angrily. And, and if, if, if it can be kind of interpreted the wrong way, I'm like, oh, let me go back to the drawing board. But if I read that email angrily and it still communicates, you know, well, then I know I've done something. I've done something that, that maybe can't be taken out of context. So just little things, seeing beyond yourself uh, in every element. And that goes professionally too, you know, 
uh, we talk about it in, in, in our school. I co-teach with a, a gentleman. And he's fantastic. And we understand that when we get into that band hall, we don't take days off at work. If I'm going to take a day off, I'm, go, I'm staying home. That's just, that's just the rule. When you're here, you're here, right? Olive Garden says, when you hear your family, well, when you hear your professional, right? So, so what I have to do is I have to take off whatever burdens I may have. My job is for the kids not to know what's going on. Like their job is not to be Dr. Phil. And I'm saying that because a lot of times we bring, we can bring uh, intentionally or unintentionally, we can bring things into that professional atmosphere that, that kind of sullies up the, the environment and the climate. So I would just tell folks at all times, S Y B Y see yourself beyond yourself. And I think, I think that, that you can't go wrong in that, in that area. Wow. I've, I've written down several things that you've, you've said, Mickey, that's, that's a, a really good one. And, and about reading emails angrily. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad we're recording so I can go back and <laughs> jot this down. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, um, and, and all of these things kind of go towards keeping the job and, and thriving. I'm, I'm, I'm really enamored that we have so many people asking questions and that makes me think that, that there are things that, that, that they want to talk about. And so I'm going to kind of, if everybody's okay with that, I'm going to kind of jog to some of those or pivot as the word is um, to some of those. And Zach and I'll just kind of go back and forth with some of these questions here. Um, I, I think one that's close to all of our hearts, um, and, and I know Savannah, you experienced this last year with Summer Symposium. Cameron asks, after giving your best efforts across the year, how important is it to refill your tank during summer, during summer professional development and network opportunities like Summer Symposium? Do you wanna talk about the experience you had like maybe with Greg Bim last summer, Savannah? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, to answer your question, you kind of set it up for us. It's very important, right? Um, I think that sometimes, when we're in kind of like the day-to-day -day drudge of things, we, um, you know, lose sight of some of the important stuff. Even, you know, being on this panel tonight is very, uh, you know, enriching and it, it's really helpful whenever you know that there's other people doing what you do, they get it uh, and all of that. So um, the thing that my mother is referring to is last year at Summer Symposium, uh, she signed me up to go and present my marching band show idea to Greg Bim. Um, and I was terrified, obviously, um, but I went and he said, who came up with this idea? I said, me? He was like, by yourself? This is great. I was like, whoa. So it was very validating in that way. Um, and he made some really good suggestions that, that I wouldn't have thought about. So um, I, I was going to say, put yourself out there. I didn't really put myself out there. She put me out there. <laughs> Um, but find mentors that will put you out there or, or just guide you in the direction, I guess, um, that you need to be in. Awesome. Uh, let me, if, yeah. if you don't mind, I think this is probably the most important thing you do as a new teacher. And, and really, it's not a new teacher thing. It's a teacher thing. Um, burnout is real. And so recognizing, okay, what I'm doing right now isn't working. How can I get help? When there's opportunities like summer symposium or there's, there's a myriad of different locations you can go, but finding those people and you go to a session and a lot of people think like, I think as a new teacher, you go to as many sessions as you can. And like, you know, I've checked all the boxes and I've, I've completed the task. And really the, the best part of the session, I, I think isn't even the actual session. Uh, the best part of the session, in my opinion, is at the end of the session. And at the end of the session is where you can actually go up to the, like the person that was on the pedestal, who is, you know, this amazing person you think you could never, ever meet and actually get to have a chance to ask them a question. And I think you'll find that a lot of these people that are experts who are actually really good at what they do, they love talking about what they do and are more than willing to help and give advice or give any kind of feedback um, that, that you might be looking for. You know, whether it's in the Midwest Clinic or your state convention, you know, the summer, pose, the, the summer programs are great because it's more informal. So, it, you know, people are in t-shirts and shorts and it feels like, oh, I can just, you know, I can walk up to Greg Bim and like, he'll say hi to me, like, that's amazing, right? But like more than that, I've, I've certainly asked a, a simple question and it turns into like an hour long discussion. It's the things that are off, uh, off the agenda. Those are, I think, the, the huge moments where a lot of learning and growth. One, I, I got a great lesson from a mentor who I happened to just meet because I was getting on the plane, going to Midwest, 
and there was only one seat left and it was right next to him. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I know, I know him, but I, I don't know him, know him. And he just proceeded to just give some great information. I had lost my voice, so I couldn't even talk. And, but he just kept on going. And cause, cause I was engaged. I really wanted to know more about, um, you know, how, how to teach orchestra better and how to just teach better and be a better teacher. And he just proceeded to just fill me up with great content. And, you know, we've kept in touch over the years and I just continually learn uh, from this person. And, and I think you'll find that, don't be afraid to, to ask a question and, and maybe, you know, after the session or maybe you'll see them again at another event. Those are such great key moments to help uh, to keep you from burning out because that can be a real, it, it is a real thing. It happens all the time. So that's a great way to help with the longevity um, and, and kind of keeping you inspired. If you're not inspired, then you're not going to be very inspiring for your students. So I think looking for ways to, to fill your cup is always really, really important. I think something right now, kind of touching on with that, and you know, it doesn't even have to be summer stuff, something that I've done with other colleagues and, you know, somebody will post something on Facebook of like, hey, who wants to have a band director happy hour on Zoom and just talk about what we're going through? And I, I know for me, um, I, I'm very fortunate to also serve on the SASE leadership team staff. And so, and which has a, I mean, I'm on that staff more to learn from them than to do anything. And so to be on a, to be on a call with people across the state and across the country and just talk about the trenches that we're in kind of helps. I know for me at the beginning of with COVID and, and, and getting the school year started, it was a huge relief just to hear that every, like we, we all know that everybody's in this, in, in the same boat right now, but just to talk about it and, and not complain, just be like, Hey, this is what I'm going through. Hey, I went through that. Or this is how we're, this is how we're, uh, what we're about to go through. What did you guys do to fix that? And, you know, one thing we, we, we always, we, as a staff, we talk about like, what are the things that we hope to keep out of uh, when we leave this COVID era of band, like what are things that we want to stick around? And like, we've talked like, we want to keep these happy hours going around with, or just socializations over Zoom, just because it allows us to connect with people um, and, and people that, you know, I, I hopped on one because because a friend of mine and my invited to it. I had knew nobody. I knew who the people were that were going to be on it, but I didn't know it. I didn't know them. And, you know, I got to connect with them. And so um, and, and get to know them and a network. And it goes back to all it's all the same stuff. And and those are the things that refill your tank um, is just getting to talk about getting to talk about what we love to do, not necessarily doing it because the doing it is the hard part getting to talk about is the re the refueling and enlightening part about it. Yeah, that, that's, that is really great. And that, and that's a key question that you need to ask when you're interviewing for the first year teachers, when you're interviewing, it's always important to ask your administrator about professional development opportunities, the way you can go and, 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 and rekindle that firing and everything. So make sure you uh, include that. We have some great questions on here, Susan. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them, but uh, I know. I and, and I asked, I just actually asked um, our, our friends with Music for All, Maddie's going to send me a list. If we don't get to the questions, then um, I will I will answer them and also ask our panelists to, to answer them um, after the session. So we'll send you a reply if we don't get to it. So, um, but we are, we are thrilled to have this many questions because that means that, that you have things that you, you want to know about. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Anthony asks, uh, what are some techniques student teachers can practice if school starts closing due to the spread of the virus again? Um, with the potential of schools closing and student teachers uh, lose the ability to gain experience, do you think this has an impact on new teachers getting their first job? So let's let's throw that out there because we I mean we're fa I'm facing with that that with my student teachers right now and then they're very nervous about not getting enough experience before it's time to get that job. So uh, would anybody like to jump on that one and and give some advice? Yeah, I can. Um, I think that this is such a unique time to be a young band director. Um, even somebody that is not so tech savvy like myself, um, I am the most tech savvy person on my hallway, right? Uh, because 
most of your colleagues are going to be older um, and not know as much about technology as we do. So um, know that you have an advantage in that way um, already, and that's a marketable skill. So thinking of how to convert um, lessons and activities into a digital format um, it is something that you can get started with right away. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities uh, where you can log in and observe teacher. I mean, we're all teaching virtually right now, you know, so reach out to someone, um, see if, if they'll allow you or if their school will allow you to just log in and be a, a fly on the wall and watch how, um, watch how they run things. Um, there, there's still plenty of opportunities to get experience. Um, and then as far as jobs next year, there will be jobs. There are always jobs. Um, your interview might happen over a Zoom call instead of in person, um, but there are, there are always jobs. So please don't worry about um, being able to be employed. We need band directors, right? We need band directors. So um, that's my advice on that one. <laughs> that's great, that's great. Hey Tanner, um, I was gonna ask you, Heather Boyd, who I guess is a student of, of, of Dr. Harris's, um, she asks, how do you work with confidence level when you're taking on a head director position with no experience as a head director? And you've had to do that uh, in, in uh, under the gun there in Texas, right? So yeah, tell us uh, I'm gonna be honest, some of it is, I wouldn't say faking it, but it's the, it's the you have to be confident in, in the decision making. I think, you know, as a head director, that was, one of the biggest learning curves that I had to learn was being competent in the decision making that I had to make to lead the program in, in the direction I wanted to go. And you had in it's hard to be confident when it's either a change if the program's been around a while. Um, you know, I, I, I took over the program, we've been, very successful program, had been to the Texas State Marching Contest uh, finalist a couple times. And so when you start making changes to what you want the program to be, um, it's not always met with um, with positive reinforcement of those changes. And so, and then I would, and I, I was always the first to admit, you know, that my first year at Wakeland, I made some changes, what I thought was the best thing for the program and for the students. And then you get through it and you get done with the year and you look back and then you get to the next fall or the next spring when you face with the same decision. And it's like, hmm, that really didn't work now that I reflect on it. And you know, it's, it's admit, you know, a, a lot of the thing I've learned too is admitting when you were wrong and admitting when you're wrong to the students and parents can get you more points than just continuing to put your head down and fight for what is not working. Um, and, 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 I, and I think, you know, building that confidence of just, you know, this is the decision that I'm making and I think it's the right one. Um, but I will say any decision I made as a head director I was always on the phone with my mentors before that decision was put out to the band program. Um, Dean Westman and David Starnes are two of my biggest mentors. And, um, and I was always bugging their ear of to like, Hey, this is what I'm, this is what I want to do. Or, Hey, this is what we did. Can like, can you help me or uh, other directors in the, down the street or whatever. And just always asking for feedback of like, Hey, this is how, what I want to do. Um, how do you handle this or, or how does it look on your campus? So, um, and so just being confident in your decision making and, and acknowledging when it's wrong, acknowledging that it's wrong and moving on. Like Mickey and Koji were saying like, it's okay to fail. We're all gonna fail, we're teachers, we're human. Our, our, we, we forget that our, like our students forget that we're human um, and, and we forget that we're human. And that's where the burnout comes in. I think for me, I know uh, where I started feeling somewhat of a burnout about year three in this position was when I didn't allow myself to be human and acknowledge the failures and learn from them and feel like I was letting the students down when I failed, when really I wasn't letting anybody down, I, except for myself, because I wasn't allowing myself to grow and as a teacher and as a person. So um, just being confident in, in the decision making and sometimes you got to fake it till you make it, uh, depending on where you are. Um, but but having that reinforcement of mentorship and and um, and the community. Yeah. I think we got time for one more question. Uh, Hunter asks, uh, while teaching uh, synchronously, what are some positive strategies to help engage our students without interrupting uh, <laughs> the question? <laughs> you took the question off. I'm sorry. Well, I think without ignoring the ones who are online as well. Sorry. I, 
I jumped ahead of you a little bit. Yeah, I lost. Several of you are teaching synchronously now, so you want to jump on that? Koji, Mickey, Savannah. Sure, uh, I, I, I'm happy to. And I'm not gonna lie, it's very challenging. I think that's one of the biggest challenges I've faced in, in teaching so far uh, has been this semester going back in a hybrid scenario. So it's one thing to have everybody in one location. We can see everybody in the squares. I can call on people. Um, but when, when you're dealing with people over here and you know, I got a Britney Spears mic going on and making sure that my technology is working and it works sometimes and sometimes it magically doesn't. Sometimes we just need some, uh, some quick little games. So, you know, I'll, I'll do just a simple, like my freshman group is usually, they're either nervous or they're, you know, antsy. And so I'll just say, hey, what, you know, look at your neighbor, say hi neighbor. What's your name? You know, some basic like icebreakers. What'd you eat for lunch? Tell them what you ate for lunch. And, you know, those of you in the chat, put it in the chat. How did you do? Like, what did you eat for Thanksgiving? What was your favorite food? And those kinds of things as I'm trying to, you know, where's the power button or what input is going out and something's wrong. There's always something going on at the beginning of class. Um, so I, I have a couple of things that I do. I always have some kind of piece of music going so that they have a good aural model that they can hear, whether it's a, you know, a professional bassist or there's a million recordings, right? Um, or, or video is even better if that's possible. So that, that's going on as they're coming in. Um, and then there's a very set procedure of what the kids that are in the room uh, that they do, right? So right now, normally they would just go ahead and get their things, get to their seats and start warming up. Um, and that works for high school, doesn't work for middle school. Um, but right now everybody comes to their seats just so that we can you know, dismiss to the locker room with just a few people at a time. Um, but having that really, the, the first day was tough because it's very procedural. Um, but I knew even though it was probably really boring for the kids that first day, the importance of setting up that procedure saves so much time in the end. That is super critical. So everybody knows they come in the room, they go around, they follow the blue lines, that they don't, you know, touch each other and get too close. And then they sit down, then I dismiss them. They know that there's a procedure. And during that time, this, the students in the room, I could say, hey, you know, they can already see that something's going on. If the video stops and my, I'm still having issues, Sometimes I can say, hey, talk to your neighbor. And, and usually at the beginning of the school year or, you know, especially after COVID when people were already, you know, like, like it was hard to just say hi to your neighbor. Like it was, it was, you know, the angst was there and there was a lot of anxiety and just kids being able to have a conversation with one another. So setting up a, like a simple, you know, very directive, look at the neighbor that's right there, find both neighbors, find out their name, their favorite color, and what is one thing they like to eat? Or what is one activity that they do outside of orchestra or band or whatever it is? Um, just so that they have a directive of, oh, my assignment is to find out about somebody. And it kind of forces them to get to know each other, which kind of eases the angst a little bit, um, lets their guard down to just be able to share and be, be human. Um, and that helps with the people here, with the people online. I usually give a very similar directive and they put it in the chat. and. And I've had, you know, a classes that were very quiet, just, you know, kind of erupt and they kind of go off on tangents sometimes in the chat. And, uh, you know, I have to kind of rein it in. I can't always type in because I'm walking around the room or, but I, I got my Britney Spears mic on so they can hear me and I'll just, you know, just address and monitor. I think that's the biggest thing um, in, in teaching is, is not really, the information is important, giving the instructions critical. The most important thing is monitoring it and giving that, that monitoring of is, is what are we doing right now, right? So whether it's, you know, how they hold the instrument, it's, and the younger they are, the more often you have to repeat it, right? I, I, a wise mentor of mine once said, you know, you teach, you teach them everything you know every single day. And that was certainly true, the younger they are, especially, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, you teach them everything you know every single day because they forget, right? And the same is true at even, even upper grades as well. There are just different things that we continually monitor and that might be behavior. Um, and it doesn't have to be a reprimand. It's just that, hey, let's remember too, we can always phrase things in a positive way. Um, and I think tone of voices goes a long, long way. Never assuming the worst, but always uh, give, giving them the benefit of the doubt because we never know where they're coming from, right? Not just what class or what they ate, but 
literally like what what is their home life at home we don't know right so giving them the benefit of the doubt and giving them a chance especially if they're the bad kid right that always gets called out in their other classes i think those are the kids that that assume that you're going to get onto them um and and i found a lot of success with with those kinds of kids just having a conversation at the end of class or before class just asking them like hey what, what music do you listen to or they'll make a comment oh you like that that's awesome i love underwater basket weaving right whatever it is um and it, that that those kinds of things go a long way go a really long way Making a connection, whether they're live or online, is important. Unfortunately, I, we could talk with this crew, I think, for, for hours um, and have lots of questions from our attendees. I'm really thrilled with that. So, so please know that we are going to address those. But unfortunately, I am going to have to kind of pull things to an end here. Um, music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in his or her scholastic environment. I want to thank Savannah Cole, Koji Mori, Mickey Smith Jr., and Tanner Smith and I, for being here with us. And I'd like to also thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out Yamaha's Educator Suite at YamahaEducatorSuite.com. Before we say goodnight, it's important to understand that now more than ever, these uncertain times continue to impact Music for All, and we're extremely grateful for any donations gifted to our nonprofit organization, especially on Giving Tuesday. Uh, if you've enjoyed tonight's program, and in order for us to continue to provide free educational resources and advocacy materials, please consider gifting to Music for All in any and amount. Your gift allows us to serve our mission with future organizational programming, such as this webinar. Please visit musicforall.org give. And finally, join us in our next episode of Mind the Gap on Tuesday. It says December 1st, but that's today. So that's not today. I think it's the 15th um, for Quality of Life, where I'll be joined by, with, by Joe Bergstaller, um, Casey Perkins, Larry Williams, John Whitman from the Yamaha Corporation. And it'll be moderated by uh, Billy Rulapa and myself. And so for tonight, for Music for All. I'm Zachary Harris. And I'm Susan Smith. Thank you all for being here and good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a great.